Welcome to Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset's Health Talk. I am Dr. Douglas Oshinsky of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. In accordance with social distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I am hosting this show from at the studio and our guests will be joining us remotely via video conferencing. Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset recently performed its first gender affirmation surgery for a transgender woman. It is one of only two hospitals in New Jersey and one of only a handful to in the Northeast to perform bottom surgery. On today's show, we will learn more about how the surgery is performed, who is a candidate, and about the process leading up to and following the surgery. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Keith, a board-certified plastic surgeon who specializes in microvascular surgery, and Dr. Neeton Patel, a urologist with expertise in robotic, reconstructive, and transgender surgery, and a member of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Dr. Keith, first uh, tell the audience a little bit about your background and what uh, uh, you do uh, in your uh, uh, surgical uh, type of, uh, with the type of surgery that you do. Sure, so thanks for having us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss our program here at RWJ Somerset. So I'm a plastic surgeon, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. I did a fellowship in microsurgery, which is the sewing together of very small things using a microscope, usually blood vessels and nerves. And you need to specialize in that type of surgery to do transgender surgery, a gender affirming surgery, which was another part of my fellowship that I did in Belgium about 10 years ago. Uh, after my fellowship, I practiced at University Hospital in Newark as part of Rutgers, where I met Dr. Patel and we started the Rutgers Center for Transgender Health together. From that uh, initial uh, pro program, we were able to perform these types of gender affirming procedures. And uh, we're here to talk more about that today. And Dr. Patel, a little bit about your background. So I'm a board certified urologist uh, who's based out of Somerset. So Dr. Keith and I actually met in Newark when we were both uh, professors uh, at Rutgers Newark. Uh, born and raised in the New York, New Jersey area, went to medical school here, did my training here. My original background was in reconstructive surgery, um, trauma surgery, and robotic surgery, which easily paved the way to doing gender confirming surgery, which we'll discuss in more detail a little later. Uh, but currently, I'm based out of Somerset, but we do these cases out of Somerset and Barnabas in Livingston. Okay, so bas basically, what, just so people know, it's RWJ Barnabas uh, Somerset Medical Center, and the other one is the uh, RWJ, well, it's actually now Cooperman uh, Medical Center up in uh, Livingston. Yes. Correct. So tell us what is uh, gender affirmation surgery so that the people understand what it is that we're going to be talking about. Sure. So to understand gender affirmation surgery, you really have to understand the concept of gender identity and the difference between sex and gender. And so sex is what's defined at birth by inspection of the genitalia of the baby by an outside professional, usually a doctor, and it's assigned to you. Gender identity is something that the patient individual uh, comes to realize on their own over the course of time, over maturation, uh, once uh, patients get closer to puberty and understand themselves better. And usually there's congruence between sex and gender. Usually uh, someone who is defined as male at birth uh, will identify as male. But about 1% of the population don't look at it that way or don't feel that way. And there's an incongruence. And that is a, an issue with what we call gender identity. And so the uh, concepts of being transgender or gender nonconforming or gender diverse come from these concepts of not having a congruence between sex and gender. Gender affirming surgery is to help align the physical state with the mental state, basically allowing us to create uh, a body that more aligns with the gender identity that has uh, been present for that patient. <clears throat> gender affirming surgeries can be in all sorts of forms, uh, whether it's talking about surgery for the face, the body, or the genitals. And what we're talking about mostly today is genital gender affirming surgery, or what we call bottom surgery. Dr. Patel, anything to add to that? Uh, no, so, so 
when what we're going to be talking about today, bottom surgery, and you know, just in terms of, um, it can go from you know simple things to the most drastic, which you know, we're going to be talking about vaginoplasty today. Um, but just to kind of give everyone an idea, even just in the state alone, in the state of New Jersey, you know, we said overall one percent that accounts to about about thirty to forty thousand patients in just the state of New Jersey alone. Just to kind of give everyone a, a reference. Good to understand. Now, you both said bottom surgery. Can you explain to the uh, audience what is bottom surgery uh, and uh, what, what do you, how is it actually performed? Sure. So there's lots of different forms of bottom surgery. And bottom surgery is a vernacular that patients use uh, to refer to any surgery that's performed on the genitals. And it's easier to say than genital gender affirming surgery. That's a mouthful to speak. So it's better to say bottom surgery for a lot of patients. It's just easier. And we like to meet patients where they are. And so that's why we use the vernacular that they use. <clears throat> like I said, it can be on a spectrum of options and an array of different diverse uh, procedures to help our patients align their physical state with the gender identity that they've chosen. <clears throat> Specifically, what we're talking about doing at RWJ Somerset and Cooperman Barnabas is vaginoplasty. So that's for someone who's been assigned male at birth and now identifies as feminine and wants to have female genitalia or female presenting genitalia. And to do that, we have to uh, perform a very specific procedure called a penile inversion vaginoplasty. This type of procedure is wherein we will remove the testicles, remove the structural components of the penis reroute the urethra and create a canal, a vaginal canal that allows that patient to have penetrative intercourse with partner. We need to do that in a, such a way that it's safe, that we don't injure the rectum or the bladder, uh, that it's reliable, that it's sensate so they can continue to have erogenous sensation. And aesthetically, it looks natural when we're all said and done. Uh, we have partnered together, Dr. Patel and I, to do that using the Da Vinci operating robot. And I'll let him speak more about that because he's the robotic expert and is very skilled at what he does. But suffice it to say, it makes it a much safer and better operation together to do this. There's other types of genital gender affirming surgeries as well uh, for patients uh, assigned female at birth uh, that are now identifying as masculine called a phalloplasty and uh, another form called metoidioplasty for masculinizing genital surgeries. Uh, those are different types of procedures that we're not really touching on today, but just to suffice to say, there's a diverse array of options out there for this type of procedure. And the other thing that everyone needs to understand is you guys were the uh, first ones to perform such th this type of uh, surgery on a transgender woman in New Jersey. So that we are the first in, in the state to get hospital privileges to do this. Um, it's hard to know exactly in the canon of, of historical firsts in surgery if someone hasn't done something in the past. But I do know that for a fact that we're the first to be able to get privileges at a hospital to do this. And that's based off our qualifications, our training, and working together within the hospital system to be able to do this safely. So I think it's pretty easy to say that, yes, we were the first to do phalloplasty and then vaginoplasty in a hospital system. And Dr. Patel, tell us about uh, uh, the robotic surgery. Again, the old Da Vinci robotic surgery that we used to use to do male terps, I, I guess you're now using to do other type of uh, procedures with. So similar concept and similar area of operation. So it, it, at the end of the day, it is pelvic surgery. So in regards to performing robotic surgery, obviously the misconception is that, oh, it's a robot doing my surgery. Well, no, it's, it's I, I conceptualize it more closer to, you know, having a fancy remote control, a, a very fancy remote control car, in other words. Um, so the robotic system is always under the control of a surgeon, but the benefits are one in terms of magnification, uh, safety, and outcomes. Hands down, it is a it's a better option than open surgery. The robotic system allows us better uh, magnification, thereby giving me a better idea of exactly where the rectum is, exactly where the bladder is, and staying very very far away from those things. Uh, but it also allows me to have a better dissection, giving patients the outcomes of a longer canal and a wider canal. Um, so, so that's the benefits of the, the robotic surgery. And, uh, you know, since we started using it about three, four years ago, we haven't looked back. As someone who's been in practice now for 33 years, I can tell you it's amazing to actually watch the robotic surgery. I've seen terps done open, 
closed, etc. And when you go into the operating room and now see the uh, urologist using the uh, Da Vinci robotic surgery, and you see how how easy they're able to do it, how fine movements they're able to do, how they can do things that we never could have done, you know, 30 years ago. And the fact that when you do it, there's such little problems afterwards. The recovery is so much easier. It, it's unbelievable. And hopefully as a kid, it, 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 you know, your parents now understand why you played Nintendo so much. Yes. <laughs> well, in my day, it was a more Atari. <laughs> <laughs> So what is required prior to surgery and what is the recovery afterwards like? Great. So we follow something called the WPATH guidelines for surgery or the standards of care set out by WPATH. WPATH stands for World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And it's basically a society of professionals that focus their careers in this sphere, taking care of transgender and gender diverse patients. And they publish every few years a standards of care set that kind of lists for professionals like us what type of criteria patients should have met or undergone in order to have these types of procedures. For bottom surgery, it's pretty clear that patients should be on hormone therapy as long as there's no medical contraindication to doing so prior to surgery. They need to be the age of consent in, in the country that the surgery is happening. So in this country, that's 18. They need to be have living in that gender identity and that role for at least a year prior to any surgery. And usually uh, it also requires us to have at least two independent psychiatric evaluations and, and affirmations of that patient's gender identity prior to having any surgery. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through for these patients uh, prior to getting to the operating table. You can't make a decision one day and come to us the next day. This really takes a long time. Additionally, we have very long wait lists for our surgery. So it usually takes about a year to even see us prior to having surgery. Uh, and then we will have to get you onto the surgery schedule after that. So it's a multiple year process uh, for patients. And so everyone is well, very well vetted, uh, very serious about this. And we work closely with our colleagues in primary care, endocrinology, and psychiatry and mental health resources to make sure our patients are well cared for before and after surgery. To your other question about how long does it take to recover, it takes a long time. I tell patients a year. Really, those first two to three months are difficult. It's also almost a whole week in the hospital. Afterwards, they have to learn how to dilate. Dilation is there to keep the canal open. You know, scars heal by getting shorter. So a circular scar heals by getting narrower. And if that can be heals too much too aggressively, patient has a hard time being able to receive a partner for penetrative intercourse. So we need to keep that open. So dilation is something they have to do religiously after surgery for about a year. Uh, so the first few months are the hardest. After that, it gets easier, but it really takes about a full year to recover. Anything to add, Dr. Patel? Yeah, so just that in regards to, you know, keep in mind that these surgeries are, you know, anywhere between six and eight hours. And with the robotic system in terms of positioning and things like that. So one of the, the one and only, I mean, you have to realize most of our patients are young and healthy, uh, but... Dr. Uh, Chopra, you know, 538. Dr. Chopra, 538. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we, so the one and only um, physical uh, constraint that we do put on patients is BMI. And, and that's just strictly for safety reasons. These patients are in a lithotomy position. They're in a Trendelenburg position. So, so they are angled. Uh, so we do have a BMI limit of uh, 35. Uh, for, for the surgery. And if, if they are above a BMI of 35, we, you know, work with nutritional and dietitians and, and uh, physical therapists in terms of losing weight and changing diet and things like that. So for the audience, a BMI is basal metabolic index. It's mm -hmm. a weight divided by height. It follows through with the old uh, United Healthcare uh, tables back in the 1960s. Basically, normal is 25 or less. 25 to 30 is uh, your overweight. 30 to 35 is your higher. 35 and above is when you're considered morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. So if you are 35 or above, we're talking about someone who's morbidly obese and therefore needs to go through dietary nutritional therapy, as you had mm -hmm. previously described, thus getting themselves in better condition prior to surgery. 
And then you, had talk, then you had talked about Trendelenburg position. That's the positioning of the patient during the surgery. And what you're going mm -hmm. to do is you have to be very careful because by doing both uh, Trendelenburg and reverse Trendelenburg positioning, we're going to be changing the way that the blood flows in order to help improve the circulation to certain areas. But by doing that, you're also going to reduce other areas from uh, receiving the oxygen and or blood. So you need to be in as good shape as possible so that there are minimum complications post-operatively. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Well, just uh, the, again, we sometimes when we talk, we talk in medical terms. And since the <laughs> audience uh, doesn't understand this, and as I said, it, if you, until you've hit the third or fourth year medical uh, school, you don't understand what a, what a BMI is, how to calculate mm -hmm. it, or what, tr in, in the, it's not until you do your surgical rotation that you understand when the, when the, uh, uh, when the uh, general surgeon says, please put them into Trendelenburg, what that actually means. <laughs> I think that's a great explanation and it really helps audiences understand that what we're trying to do here is not fat shame or be a gatekeeper for surgery, but really keep our patients safe. We take safety uh, really seriously in the operating room and trying to keep our patients being able to have surgery well, uh, recover well, and without complications. So some patients don't understand that. And, you know, BMIs are challenging in the really tall patients, which a lot of our trans women are very tall. And so that can throw off some of the calculations. And, and we're not hard and fast on that. If you're pretty close, yeah. we're pretty lenient. Um, and we, we do, you know, adhere to that. And it's a technical limit. You know, the, the instruments are only so long. So if there's a lot of extra tissue in the abdomen, it's hard for Dr. Patel to get down to the pelvis through all of that with the instruments that they make. So in addition to the positioning that we were talking about and the issues with oxygenation and just keeping the patient safe on the table. So it's a really important uh, uh, set of things to think about. And that's why we do what we do. And it's not, it's not something we're just trying to keep patients out of our OR. We're, we're trying to get them in. We just want to do it safely. Well, again, what you're doing is you're doing it as be in the, the as best shape as possible so that they have the best outcomes possible with a minimal amount of uh, complications from it. It's hard enough for the patient, they've been going through this, you know, uh, for so many years. They then got, become a candidate, so they see you, they go through all of the nutritional counseling, the psychological counseling. They're probably going to need to see a, a pulmonary person. They may need to see uh, Dr. Patel prior to, to ensure that urination and everything is going to be fine post-operatively. Mm -hmm. It's a long, long process. And again, it, it's six hours of surgery. Six hours of surgery is a lengthy procedure. So what we're trying to do is have them in the best medical condition possible possible so that one, they have the minimal amount of complications, but also more importantly, the best outcomes possible. Exactly. Yep. So it leads us to, again, how did you get this partnership between the two of you? It's unusual, a plastic <laughs> surgeon and a urologist together. It is. Uh, and I'll tell you my side of things, and then maybe Dr. Patel can tell his version of the story. But <laughs> my side of things is, you know, I was recruited to come to Rutgers after my fellowship training uh, to start a program in microsurgery. And I met some transgender patients along the way, and I had the training to be able to help them. But there was no one had ever done that before in that in the state. And we had no program in, in, in place, and, and we didn't have privileges to do it. And, and we actually, had, and before Dr. Patel and I kind of even met, no one ever even really tried to do it robotically. So uh, being able to talk with Dr. Patel and, and kind of twist his arm over the years and say, please help me, I want to do these surgeries. And there was some resistance at first, just because I think it's unknown. You, you know, going into unknown territory is hard for a lot of doctors and taking those risks. Um, but the patients asked us to do so, and we needed to respond. And eventually Dr. Patel it was very brave of him to, to agree to help me. And um, after I twisted his arm enough times, he, he said yes. And so we embarked on this journey together, but we did it safely. We did it slowly. Uh, we even did cadaver studies and we tried to figure things out. We watched videos together and we critiqued other things. We searched the literature. We did everything we could possibly do, talked to our hospital system and found ways uh, to get credentialed to do this in a safe, thoughtful approach. And even after doing the first one, we waited almost almost a year after we, to do the second one to really see how she did, to make sure there weren't complications, even long term problems prior to doing you know embarking on the next uh, journey, which now we're near a hundred of these that we've done uh, since that time point about four years ago. But that's so that's my viewpoint on it. I, I don't know if Dr. Patel has a different <laughs> view. <on it. laughs> 
me uh, begging a lot, but I don't know. But that's how I th- I see. No, it. and listen at the at the end of the day when when Jonathan first came to me and I said, listen, uh, I don't know about this. I've never done this before. <laughs> But at the same time, knowing what I knew, knowing, you know, what I could do and in terms of, you know, doing robotic surgery and doing trauma at Newark, um, between all the urologists there, I I knew that, listen, if there was anyone who was going to help him and make this, um, you know, and do this safely more, more than anything else, just do this safely. At least I was confident that, you know, between my robotic skills and, and the trauma surgery that I had done, um, I think we can do a good job, um, but I will tell you, you know, we are comfortable today only because, you know, I am my biggest critic and John is my biggest critic and vice versa. You know, the surgery that we do today is drastically different than what we did four or five years ago. Every single month, we're always trying to, to, to better ourselves uh, and, and change techniques to make this better. Um, so, you know, he, he I think he has confidence in what I do. I have confidence in what he does. Um, so I, I couldn't have asked for a better team in terms of two people who are good at what they do, not trying to do other people's things. Well, I have to, actually, I have to congratulate you both for what, what you do and the fact that as a physician, you still continue the education and continue to the improvement, the self-improvement on yourself in order to do what's best for the patient. It's something that it, it's so nice to hear from uh, physicians willing to continue to learn, relearn, retrain, and do something better each day. Thank you. I mean, it's Thank tough in this space. That there isn't a textbook to look at. There isn't a symposium to go to over the weekend and learn how to do this. This is something that we had to really be on the frontier of to learn how to do and do well and do safely to help our patients. You know, uh, Hippocrates said that the only proper school for surgeons is war. And I really view that our our friendship, our partnership here is really forged in the war that was working in Newark <laughs> University Hospital. Uh, there's a yeah. fraternity to working in a, a place like that, that you see the most complex pathology, uh, patients at the fringes, people totally injured by uh, car accidents and gunshots and other things. And so we were able to really hone our skills as reconstructive doctors, both in urology and plastic surgery, prior to ever embarking on this mission of elective surgery to help transgender and gender diverse patients. So I think, thank you for recognizing that. Um, and I think it's really quite unique. There's only a handful of other programs where plastic surgery and urology work together like this. Usually it's one or the other or gynecology not to, you know, alone in silos instead of together. So this synergy really seems to make sense. And again, the synergy brought together by the leadership at RWJ Barnabas uh, uh, Medical Center and Barnabas Medical Group, seeing how important something like this is, seeing that the two of you work well together, seeing the work you previously had done at, uh, at the, in Newark and getting you together and getting you the ability to be able to do this. You know, it's basically very visionary. Yeah, I would say that it's really great from the leadership from RWJ Somerset really putting their money where their mouth is. They, you know, they built the BAP Sipperstein Proud Center. Uh, and Dr. Patel can speak a little bit more about that. But, you know, Dr. Patel was recruited there as a urologist and, and he brought this mm-hmm. idea to them and they really supported it. And they wanted to build a new program and ask us to assist with that. And so I can let him talk more about that is itself, but I think it, it is really good about their leadership there. Uh, we Let's go to the Bab Sipperstein uh, Proud Center. It recently marked its fifth anniversary this year. Mm-hmm. It's part of the RWJ Barnabas uh, Somerset Medical Center, and it is a, even, and they call themselves proud, and we are very proud of them for everything that they do. So tell us a little bit about the Proud Center and what the Proud Center does for your patients. So, you know, the uh, so Jonathan and I, we've been doing the case uh, at Barnabas Livingston uh, for the last four four plus years. Um, so when I joined RWJ Somerset, which was uh, November of 2020, uh, you know, as as my partners were kind of taking me around, like you know, this is the hospital, this is this, this is that, uh, we all of a sudden we come around. Uh, oh, by the way, we have a proud center and an LGBTQ center that's you know been around for several years, and we have uh, family medicine here endocrinology. Uh, at times we've had mental health and a nurse practitioner and patient navigators. I'm like, wait a second, 
this is like my, my dream scenario. This is what we tried to build in Newark and had so much difficulty doing. A, a multidisciplinary team specifically um, with the goal of treating the LGBTQ community. Um, so by having the BAP Cybersene Center, it, it really kind of puts everything into one building, one area where patients can get, you know, care, you know, from all aspects of life, whether it be medical treatment, mental health treatment, uh, which is where it really starts, and then eventually make it their make their way to surgical treatment. Um, so we work, I mean, at least I work very closely with the BAP Cybersene Center with, you know, Dr. Uh, I'll wall there and then the nurse practitioners and, and whatnot uh, in terms of taking care of these patients and making sure that they're uh, they're good from a mental health, medical health, and surgical health. Again, the uh, Bab Sipperstein Proud Center really does the community at large unbelievable mm -hmm. what they do. There's nothing in the you know in there. There's uh, nothing. Nothing like it around here. You know, e e you, when you even compare it to any places similar to New York, there's nothing like it. And the fact that it's local allows mm -hmm. the people in this community to have the best possible care, the best possible uh, community of care, the best possible team of care that allows them to have as good a life as possible. It, it, it's wonderful what they do. And then it allows people such as you to practice medicine on them and to do what's best for them, to be able to do the gender mm -hmm. affirmation surgery, which they couldn't get to other places. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's great for patients to, to, to feel that, oh, you know what, I, you know, most other places, okay, well, I have to go to the endocrinologist here, the medical doctor here, the, the mental health specialist over here, the cert, and they're all different systems, different medical records. So, you know, by having a, a system in place where, you know, everyone is talking to each other, everyone has the same electronic medical record, patients can, you know, easily, I don't want to say plugged in, but get plugged in um, where it's essentially, they get to have all their care in one location, which makes it you know, a lot less uh, daunting for these patients. Again, something well de defined by leadership as well as the practitioners at RWJ Barnabas Health. Seeing the future, understanding the future, understanding how important a single electronic medical record system is. Both of you should be very, very proud of everything that you've done that the long journey that patients have that leads up to the surgery, that the uh, Bab Sipperstein Proud Center actually helps you uh, get the right candidates, helps you with the uh, preliminary uh, information, helps you post-operatively as they've got the mental health, they've got the endocrinologists. You both hopefully feel, you, you both hopefully feel, <laughs> that hopefully you both feel terrific for such an impact that you both have on patients. Is there any last thing, any last things you want the you know, audience to know? I, I would just like to also thank the leadership at RJ, uh, RWJ Somerset, Dr. Uh, Tony Kava, Dr. Maffa, Perry Farhat, uh, Sunitha John, all the people in the leadership there have done such a wonderful job welcoming this program, supporting this program and making sure that the patients also feel centered and cared for. Well, as you mentioned, it's a great center, but you know, there's a saying that the best healthcare is local, um, but if the best, if the local healthcare is also superlative and amazing, I think that's just such a win-win. So it's such a wonderful thing. Uh, I feel wonderful taking care of these patients. It is personally fulfilling to me. It's been basically a mission since I was a medical student to help this uh, diverse set of patients. So I'm really happy that we can continue to evolve this in New Jersey. And now we have two hospitals that do it. And I'm really happy for, and thankful for this fellowship with uh, my partner, Dr. Patel here. And Dr. Patel, any last uh, thoughts? Uh, no, I just, uh, like I said, I, I'll echo Dr. Keith. Uh, I, I am very proud of what we do. And I'm extremely proud of the fact that we can have patients and help them achieve their truest self. Um, and that's all I can say. Thank you both for being here and thank you for what you do for our community. Thank you very much thank for your you. time. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. That concludes today's episode of Health Talk. 
Please remember the opinions expressed here today by our medical expert are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call us at 888-724-7123. For more information about LGBTQ plus medical care at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, please visit rwjbh.org forward slash Somerset Proud.